My name is Jenny Panahidis, and I am currently working in biomedical technologies in the Emerging Health Research Group within CSR Biosciences. And today my talk will be around the synthetic treatments that we are currently targeting to treat drug-resistant malaria. So just a quick overview of where I'm planning on going in this talk. I'm going to start by giving you a contextual background for where we are with malaria currently, what causes malaria, what the resistance patterns are and how resistance occurs, and then I'll go into a little bit of detail after this background about what the CSIR research currently is and where we are going to go in the future. So there are many references to the unique and periodic fevers of malaria found throughout recorded history. The earliest ones we could find were in 2700 BC in China. The term malaria actually originated from the medieval Italian words mala aria, which meant bad air. And this came about because they thought that malaria was caused by the bad air around swamps. So today, please note there is a correction here. There are now five Nobel Prizes that have been awarded within the field of malaria research. The first was in 1902, and it was around the discovery of the vector for malaria. The second was in 1907. It was around the discovery of the parasite that transmitted the disease. The third was in 1927, and it was for the first drug used in the treatment of malaria for quinine. The fourth one was in 1948, and that one was around the use of DDT as a malaria preventative agent. The current one was awarded this week, so it's the 2015 Nobel Prize Award, and that was given around the discovery and isolation of artemisinin, which is a malaria drug. Okay, so just to give everyone in the audience a little bit of a background as to what malaria is doing in the world right now, I have referred to the 2014 malaria statistics that were provided by the World Health Organization. So in 2014, they reported that 97 countries still had ongoing malaria transmission. They also estimated that approximately 3.3 billion people are at risk of contracting malaria. And of those 3.3 billion people, 1.2 billion are now considered to be in high-risk groups. The 2014 statistical report actually showed the numbers of diseases that had occurred and infections that had occurred in 2013. So in 2013, they estimated that 198 million cases occurred in, around the world. And from those cases, there were 584,000 reported deaths. Of those 584,000 reported deaths, 90% occurred in Africa. And of those 90%, most of them occurred in children under the age of five years old and in pregnant women. So as you can see, this is a very big global health issue right now. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background because I'm assuming not everyone in the audience is a biologist or has a background to malaria. And basically, in order to have a malaria infection, there are two things that you need to have present. The first is that you need to have a parasite, and the second is that you need to have a vector. So the malaria parasite is actually a single-celled eukaryotic parasite of the plasmodium genus. And although there are over 100 species reported already, only five of them actually cause malaria in humans. So these five are Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium ovale, Plasmodium malariae, and Plasmodium nolisi. Now, the two that we're going to talk about a little bit more in this discussion today are Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. Plasmodium falciparum is very widely distributed throughout the world, and it is actually the causative agent of cerebral malaria, and this is the one that causes most of the deaths. Plasmodium vivax is also a very big problem throughout the world. It is found mostly in Southeast Asia, and it does not cause the high death ratio that falciparum malaria does, but it does cause a massive infection and causes people to be incredibly sick and unable to function. So as I mentioned, there is also a vector that we have to consider, and I'm sure everyone in the room already knows that the vector for malaria is a mosquito, but it's not just any old mosquito. It's specifically mosquitoes of the Anopheles genus, and we're looking specifically at females. Now, if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, the Anopheles mosquitoes that we are specifically looking at are Anopheles fenestris, Anopheles gam and, and Anopheles gambiae. So to explain a little bit about malaria and what's going on, I thought I should maybe start by introducing the life cycle of the parasite. So I'm going to start with the life cycle here, where the mosquito bites the human, and the human becomes infected. So at that point, you have the first mosquito that bites you, and this mosquito is already infected with sporozoites which are from the malaria parasite. When it bites you, in order to make sure that the blood flows freely into the mosquito, it injects an anticoagulant agent. When it does that, if it's infected with the parasite, it also injects those sporozoites into the person. 
these sporozoites then move into the liver stage. And in the liver stage, they infect the hepatic cells. Now, there are two things that can happen at this point. In some cases, they stay in the hepatic cells, and they just sit there dormant for a while. In other cases, they immediately multiply. So in the hepatic cell, they can form hypnozoites, as shown here. And th this is the dormant phase. So this only occurs in Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium ovale when it sits in the hepatic cells for a while and hangs around there. And that's what causes your relapses. But in the end, both of them eventually mature to form mature liver stage schizons, and these rupture to release merozoites. And this is a little important section for my talk later on, so please take a little bit of note. Um, but what happens then is it enters the blood stage, and there is an interurethrocytic cycle that occurs. So what happens is your erythrocytes, or your blood cells, are infected, and then the parasites mature into trophozoites and eventually into schizons, which rupture and reinfect other blood cells. And this cycle will continue to go on until either you take a drug, which stops the, the cycle in its tracks, or in some people you have an immune response that clears it. But while this is going on, there is a small proportion of the parasites that actually mature into the sexual stages of the parasite, and these are called gametocytes. And these are what are actually taken up by another mosquito that comes along and bites you if you're an infected human. So then what happens is this mosquito takes up the gametocytes when it feeds and it takes the blood into it, and these then mature into eukinates and oocysts, which eventually rupture to release sporozoites, and the whole cycle starts all over again. Okay. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, I'm just going to show you some pictures now so that you can see exactly what it looks like. Um, I mentioned that in the asexual stages, you have a ring going into a trough, into a schizont, and back. So this cycle takes about 48 hours in Plasmodium falciparum, and you can see here, not so clearly, these are rings, those big fat things are troughs, and those are the schizons that are about to rupture, the little dots being the merozoites. As I also mentioned, a few of them go into the sexual stage cycle, and this is actually a five-step cycle, which takes about two weeks to complete. Now, when you have all of your parasites sitting in these blood stages, and the, the parasite load is mostly in the blood, you find the patients present in the clinic as being symptomatic. And as I mentioned before, these symptoms actually only stop when you give medicine to slow it down. As I also mentioned previously, some of the parasites, especially in Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium ovale, can sit in the liver cells. And this period when they sit in the liver cells can be anywhere from 3 to 45 weeks. And after that, the relapse then occurs. So just to give you an idea about resistance and what I'm talking about, because it was in the title of my talk, um, there have been a number of drugs that have been used for malaria treatment over the years. And there have been a number of times in the history of malaria treatment that the community and the scientific community thought that they pretty much had it, and they thought that they had one and that we were going to eradicate malaria, and that didn't always occur. So just as a history lesson, the first drug that was introduced was quinine. It was introduced in 1632. And it was actually a natural product isolate from the Chinchona bark. The first case of resistance was actually only measured in 1910. But this was introduced originally as a, an extract, not as pure compound. So that could explain that. The second drug came about through some German scientists who were doing research to find a replacement for quinine. And they discovered chloroquine, which was introduced in 1945. After the Second World War, this was used in the WHO's worldwide rollout campaign to eradicate malaria. Unfortunately, it was not successful, and resistance occurred in 1957. Proganol was the next replacement drug. It was introduced in 1948, and within a year, we had seen resistance. Proganol was quite a good drug, actually, before the resistance came about. So a lot of the scientists went back and researched the drug class and discovered pyrimethamine. But because of the problems where resistance had come about quite quickly, um, they attempted to make a drug with two drugs in it to try and increase efficacy and also reduce the chance of resistance occurring. This combination was introduced in 1967, and unfortunately, resistance still occurred. The next one that came along was mefloquine, and this is actually quite an interesting story. This came about as a combined research product project between the US Army Medical Research Center, the World Health Organization, and a private company, um, Hoffman LaRoche. They found mefloquine and used it originally as a chemopreventative agent, which is still used for today. And it was the first compound that they used as such. 
It has also been used in the treatment of malaria, however, and resistance has also been shown. The last one, which is one of the newer ones, which I just want to show you, was a tavaquone. And again, you can see the resistance occurs quite quickly. So now I'm talking a lot about resistance, a lot about resistance. So the biggest one that we noticed originally was chloroquine. And as I mentioned, resistance occurred throughout the world and spread throughout the world wherever it's green. It's currently, we currently have resistance to chloroquine. And we could learn a lot from this. The resistance spread fairly rapidly. It spread pretty much throughout the whole world. And it caused millions of deaths. And so now we have learned a lot from this in saying that if we see resistance starting to occur, we need to change the strategy of drug usage. So I want to talk now a little bit about our most recent compound and the most recent um, combination therapy that has been given. And this is a drug called artemisinin. Now, the scary part of this talk is that artemisinin resistance has already been detected in five countries in Southeast Asia. So if you look here, it's been detected in Thailand, Myanmar, Vietnam, the Lao People's Democratic Republic, and Cambodia. And this was again from the 2014 World Health Organization report. And the concern now is that along the Thailand-Cambodia border, there is a lot of resistance. And in fact, none of our current, currently recommended treatment re regimens are providing acceptable cure rates. So from this picture that I've painted, you can probably see quite clearly that resistance and multi-drug resistance is becoming a huge problem. So because of all the resistance that I've talked about, novel classes of compounds that can inhibit the spread of multi-drug resistant malaria are now urgently needed. As such, our current research is focusing on identifying novel chemical entities of structurally diverse classes. And we have a number of things that we actually want in those drugs. We specifically want those compounds to have either reactive oxygen species or the ability to disrupt the parasite's reduction oxidation ca cascade. And in addition to that, we would like them to be able to have transmission blocking ability. So you're probably saying, well, how are we going to do this? That sounds like a bit of a pipe dream. And we have quite a good strategy in place. And the way we are going to do this is we are going to utilize the, the CSR's unique platform to analyze various stages of the life cycle of the parasite. Our aims are to assay the synthetic library for activity against Plasmodium falciparum, to screen any lead compounds that we have identified for cytotoxicity in mammalian cells, and to rapidly identify these lead compounds for further development. And the further development will hopefully be done by translating the results into novel dr drugs or novel chemical entities through our collaborative research network. So now before I talk about the biological assays, I thought let me just explain to you a little bit about where these compounds came from. So we have a CSR synthetic library, which is a whole series of compounds that have been made for other projects and other things over the years and have been left to sit in or currently being unused. So we are using those compounds for our screening assays to hopefully find other uses for compounds that have had a massive investment in the past. So within this library, we identified seven classes of compounds based on different chemical structures that we decided to screen. So today, I'm only going to present the results of one of these chemical classes to you. So, okay, so these novel synthetic compounds have been screened in vitro. So for anyone in the audience who doesn't know what in vitro means, in vitro means it's not in man and it's not in an animal. It means we're growing these in a flask in blood. Okay. So the asexual stages have been cultured in vitro, and we are specifically looking at Plasmodium falciparum. We have screened a number of chloroquine susceptible strains, including 3D7, HB3, and NF54. We have also screened a number of chloroquine resistant strains, including W2 and FCR3. We have also included one pyrimethamine resistant strain, 7G8, and most recently we have included two artemisinin resistant strains, which are IPC3445 and IPC5202. These are both patient isolates from Cambodia. In addition to the asexual cycle, remember I mentioned that some of the parasites go into the sexual stages, we are also doing intraurethrocytic stage screening of the sexual stages. And we are specifically looking at plasmo Plasmodium falciparum in 54 where we are growing stage 4 and stage 5 gametocytes. Okay, so now I'm going to go back and explain a little bit about the assay. So the first assay that we do is called PLDH assay, and this is against the asexual stages of the parasite. 
when we run this assay, we normally run this assay in three single concentration points. So a high concentration, a medium concentration, and a low concentration. As I mentioned, these are the results for only one of our classes. And in that class, we had 97 compounds that we assayed. And we identified 29 highly active compounds. So this 3D plot here is just showing the percentage parasite viability, or the percentage of parasites that are still alive and growing against the compound numbers, and we have a control of chloroquine and a control of artemisinin or dihydroartemisinin in here. So the values are not so important at this point. What I wanted you to just notice from this is that if you look across the ranges, we have activity occurring in all of the different color regions. And the color regions are quite important because this line here represents, and this line over here represents the two chloroquine-sensitive strains. This represents a chloroquine-resistant strain, in purple, we are looking at a pyrimethamine-resistant strain, and the light blue and the orange one are the artemisinin-resistant strains. So what this shows you is that across some of the compounds, we have been able to identify compounds that potentially could have the activity to act against multidrug-resistant strains. But obviously, that's not enough data. I can't stand here and tell you I have a novel drug based on a single concentration assay. So what we actually need to do as drug discovery people is to work out the IC50 values. So the IC50 value is the inhibitory concentration at which 50% of the parasites are killed. And then the way we do this is by plotting a curve of par percentage parasite viability against concentration. And you can see it's a sigmoidal curve, and then we calculate the inflection point, And that gives us our IC50 value. So we have performed this for all of the strains, for all of the compounds, and we have done this at 11 concentrations. And from that, we have found six active compounds, where I have to find active between 0.1 and 1 micromolar, 16 highly active, and what is very interesting is that we have four extremely active compounds. So these compounds are already active in the nanomolar range. So it's probably a little bit boring for you to see from that point of view. So I've just color-coded the graph just to show you the IC50 values that we've already obtained. And these are the 29 compounds that we considered active in the single concentration assay that we continued with. And then the examples I've given are the 3D7, NF54, SCR3, and W2 lines. And what I want you to just see is that everything that is red is classified as highly active. So we have got, in this compound class, a lot of highly active compounds. OK. Now, as I mentioned, we also look at the sexual stages, not specifically only at the asexual stages. So in these assays, we've again done single concentration assays and IC50 assays, and we have screened specifically against stage 4 and stage 5 kinetocytes. And out of the 29 compounds we originally started with, we found that 17 are in fact active against the gametocytes, which could indicate that these compounds would potentially have activity as malaria transmission blocking agents. Finally, just as a backup, we also screen all the compounds for cytotoxicity. In this example here, I've just shown HeLa cells, but all I want you to be able to see from the slide is that we have been able to show some selectivity between the parasites and the healthy cells. Okay, so to summarize, to date, a series of 29 compounds have been identified from one overall cluster of compounds of two classes which represent extremely active lead compounds against the malaria parasites, and that the lead compounds are of interest for further investigation. So to conclude, I would like to end with a quote from Bill Gates. Whenever someone asks me why we should fight malaria, I have a simple answer. Because it kills so many people, more than 600,000 every year. And it leaves so many more people too sick to function, which holds back the world's poorest from making the most of their lives. Malaria has gone from the US and Europe, but where it is still a problem, few diseases do more to limit human potential. This may all sound hopeless, but I'm actually quite optimistic that we can eventually eradicate malaria. So I would like to just say thank you to my research group and the people that have helped with this project. So specifically, this is the malaria research group, um, our RGL Dolly Mankama, um, Anu Turan, who's helped with the gametocyte assays, Malefa Teslanyi, who has helped with all the asexual assays, and Natasha Kolesnikova, who's not in the picture, but she's helped with our cytotoxicity work. I'd also like to just thank um, the chemists that have been involved and have provided us with all the synthetic compounds, especially Chris Van Vestes and Chris Parkinson and Kevin Wellington. 
And we'd also like to thank the CSR Young Researcher Establishment Fund and the NRF Professional Development Program for funding. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny Lee.